Good evening, everybody. Welcome to Empire Without End, Total World Conquest in Roman Literature. Uh, first, let me take a moment to thank the Henrichsburg Foundation for making this possible, and also all of you for attending uh, tonight, joining your interest on this night. Um, allow me to introduce to you Dr. Randall Pogorzelski. Hi. Right. He is currently assistant professor at uh, Western University. Right. Um, on his way to the next status, right, as a social professor, hopefully tenure from the next year here, right? His background, he is from the greatest graduate program <laughs> in the country, <laughs> the University of California, Santa Barbara, right? He has a uh, background in comparative literature, currently a very uh, well-regarded expert in imperial, uh, Roman imperial poetry. He has a book coming out in the very near future, uh, Virgil and Joyce, which you can pre-order on Amazon. <laughs> uh, well, let's give a warm welcome to Dr. Randall Pontus. Thank you. Well, thanks, Dan, and I'll reiterate thanks to everyone for being here, and thanks to the, the is it the Hendricks Murphy Foundation, the Hendricks Murphy Foundation, for inviting me down here. I'm, uh, I'm glad to have a chance to talk to you guys. As Dan said, what I want to talk about today is Empire Without End, Total World Conquest in Roman Literature. This is something that I've been thinking about for a little while, and as Stan said, I, uh, I've been working on Virgil and James Joyce. And I started thinking about Total World Conquest in Roman Literature with one of the very obvious passages in Roman Literature from Virgil's Aeneid, in which uh, very early on in the first book of Virgil's Aeneid, long before Rome is founded, uh, Jupiter tells Venus about the, the future of the Romans. And one of the things that he says is, Romulus will take up the race and will found the walls of Mars, and he will call them Romans after his own name. For these I place no limits of affairs or time. I have given them empire without end. He says, imperium sine fine. That's the uh, power without limit. And he specifies there's going to be no limits of, of, of affairs, of things rarum, and there's going to be no limits of time. There's, uh, there's no, uh, no time limit for the empire. So you imagine here that Jupiter is telling Venus not about the time that Virgil is writing between 29 and 19 BCE, early in the Augustan period, the beginning of the Roman Empire, but uh, rather, this is, uh, this is about the distant future of Rome, that the empire will never end, and one day the Romans will conquer the entire world. But I'm not sure that's, that's exactly right, given that Augustus, when he died in 14 CE, left uh, a, a, an account of his accomplishments, the res gestae dewi augusti, the, the deeds accomplished of the, the deified Augustus. And there were inscriptions of the, the race <coughs> guest I set up all around the empire, uh, copies. And those copies started with the, the words, below is a copy of the achievements of the deified Augustus, by which he made the world subject to the rule of the Roman people. Quibus orbem terrarum imperio populi romani subiecit. And here we see not some distant future in which the Roman Empire lasts forever and conquers the entire world, but Augustus, when he died in 14 CE, or, or AD 14, when he died, said that he had, in fact, already subjected the entire world to the empire, the, the power, the rule of the Roman people. And I, I think that Augustus knew very well, just as much as we know, that, in fact, what Augustus did was not subject the, the entire world to the rule of the Roman people. In fact, a hundred years after the death of Augustus, when the Roman Empire reached its greatest territorial extent, he, uh, uh, it covered, in fact, about a little over half of the surface area that the continental United States does now. And a conservative estimate is that the Roman Empire, at its height, included about 20 to 25 percent of the world's population. Some people would push that as high as maybe 35 percent, but Trying to figure out ancient populations is a lot of guesswork and, uh, and a more conservative estimate of, say, 20 to 25 percent of the world's population. So whether you measure uh, the size of an empire by the number of people in it, the percentage of the world's population that it includes, or the, just the geographical extent of its territory, Rome never did achieve a, a total world empire. And Augustus knew that very well. Uh, at the very least, there was over here next to the Roman Empire the Parthian Empire. 
Um, and here we can see that Trajan had managed to, to gain some temporary and not so stable control over Armenia and the Tigris and the Euphrates down here, um, but he never really controlled the Parthian Empire. Augustus had negotiated some, uh, some settlements with the Parthians that he claimed made the Parthians subordinate to the Romans, so maybe he had some, some claim that the, that the Roman Empire included at least the Parthian Empire, which was the, the current version of the Persian Empire. But you can see up here that the Roman Empire never really extended very far into Germany and their Sarmatians and their Scythians. The Romans know very well that there are people who are independent of their empire. And so one of the things that I want to ask today is, did the Romans really think that they had a total world empire? Was it obvious to some Romans and not others? Was it a, a, a bit of cognitive dissonance? dissonance? Was there a, a, a contradiction in the way that they thought, knowing that there were people outside their empire, but they, had, they, they, they still could claim a total world empire? And I think one of the reasons that they, they, they can resolve this contradiction, or that they can claim a total world empire, is that from a pretty early date, from about the middle of the second century BCE, Rome had no real significant rivals in the Mediterranean. This is now after the destruction of Carthage, after the destruction of, uh, of Corinth, and the Roman armies were, were pretty victorious. They went through periods when they weren't totally victorious. At the, the beginning of the first century BC, they suffered some serious defeats. But in general, the Romans felt like if they wanted something, they could take it. So they knew India was there. Uh, and they knew that they hadn't occupied India militarily, but they thought, if we wanted to, we could send an army there and the Indians couldn't stand up to us. So it's not so much that they, they occupied the entire world with their army as they felt that their, their power gave them the right to act as they wanted to in any particular part of the world. So taking a look at those claims in Roman literature, I think the first thing that it's important to do is think about the words that the Romans use when they talk about the entire world. Because the Roman conception of what the, the earth looked like is a little bit different from our conception. Uh, and the words that they used were a little bit different. This is a, a map from a, a 17th century geography book by a guy named Petrus Bertius, uh, or Peter de Bertius, a, a Flemish guy. And it's a strange thing about antiquity that the ancient Greeks and Romans didn't draw a lot of graphical maps. In fact, uh, until uh, late antiquity, until maybe the third or fourth century, it seems like the Romans uh, didn't have hardly any graphical maps at all. Instead, they described the world in, in words and lists of distances between places. And so uh, Petrus Bertius was using ancient geography, using the texts of ancient geography to draw some maps in what the world looked like. And some of those words, uh, were the Greek word that usually gets used to mean the whole world is here, oikumene, the, uh, the, the word from which we get ecumenical. Uh, it literally means the inhabited space. And the usual way that the Romans translated that Greek word, and they got most of their geography from Greek people, uh, was orbis terrarum. And what that literally means is the, the, the orb of the lands, the, the, the circle of the lands. So here's a map that, uh, that Bertius gets from Posidonius, who's a, a Hellenistic geographer. And he says that actually the world looks like, um, uh, uh, looks like the, uh, the bit of a sling where you put the stone when you're going to whirl the sling around and, and throw the stone. Um, and you can see here the, the strings uh, at the edges of the, the map. Um, and this, I think, originally comes from a Homeric conception of the world. So in Homer, we get this idea that the world is like a disc, like disc world. Um, and you've got the three continents that, that, Homer, uh, that Homer imagined. You've got uh, 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 Africa and Europe and Asia, and they're all in a circle. And there's the Mediterranean or the Aegean in the, in the middle there. And the ocean is a, a ring around that inhabited place. And the sun goes over the top, and then under the bottom at night, and then over the top in the, in the day. And even though by the classical period, and certainly by the time that the, the Romans were in charge of things, the, the Greeks and the Romans were well aware that the Earth was at least roughly spherical, they still held on to this idea of Europe and Asia and Africa being a, a roughly round kind of thing. 
Um, and they imagined that what was going on was that in the northern hemisphere, there was a, a round chunk of land, and because they knew they could go farther to the east and west than the north and south, they imagined it now being kind of oblong, and you get the ocean going around it, and they figured there was an ocean down here, and it was going around this oblong chunk of land that included Europe and Asia and Africa. And they theorized, though they didn't know if anybody could actually get to these, that for the Earth to be balanced, there must be other continents, other places that were not inhabited by people or were inhabited by people that were not reachable, uh, say, in the southern hemisphere and on the other side of the world <coughs> to keep the, the Earth nicely balanced. So you could imagine them sort of imagining something like the Americas on the other side of the world, but having no idea if it was actually there and thinking maybe it would be impossible to, to get to such places. So when Augusta says that he subjected the world to the rule of the Roman people, what he says is he subjected the Orbis Terrarum, this sort of one oval bit of land in the northern hemisphere, uh, and that, gets, that, that, gets, that stands to mean the whole at least inhabited world, or at least the world that people can reach. And the Romans from a very early date, even though they didn't have a military occupation of the entire Orbis Terrarum, started using rhetoric of total world conquest. So Plutarch reports for us a speech of Tiberius Gracchus, which scholars generally believe to be an authentic speech, uh, a speech by Gracchus from about 133, in which Plutarch, who writes in Greek, translates Gracchus as saying, Curioites oikumenes enai legomenoi. They are said, that is, the Romans are said to be masters of the world. And the word that he uses there is the case oikumenes, the masters of the world, uh, the, the ecumen, the oikumenes. Um, and in 81 BC, or rather in 80, writing about Sulla in 81 BCE, Cicero says that, uh, that Sulla, uh, of Sulla, when he alone ruled the Republic, when he was in charge of Rome uh, and governed the world. And what he says there is orbem terrarum gubernare, the, the, the orb of the land he, he governed, when he governed the, the world. So we, we see these terms being used in the second century and the first century to mean that the Romans effectively are, are without match in the entire world. But after that, things get a little bit intensified. So Diodorus Siculus records for us an inscription that Pompey the Great set up in Asia in about 62 BCE. Uh, and what that inscription, uh, or at least part of that inscription, says, ta horia tes hegemonias tois forois tes ges prospibasas. He made the limits of the empire resemble the limits of the earth. And you might note here that the, instead of using the, the oikumene, he uses his gays here, the, the gay, the, the earth, uh, rather than the, the orb of the lands. And that kind of rhetoric of, of expanding the, the ecumenical, the inhabited world, to include the whole sphere, we see in visual culture as well. So here, for example, is a coin issue of the, the future Augustus, when he was still Caesar, the, the son of the god Helios. And so here is the young Octavian, and he is standing here on a, a globe. You see the circle with the, the, sort of the marks of latitude and longitude on it. He has power over the entire world. And that's not the first time we see such a thing. Although we don't actually have a copy of the statue surviving, we have reliable descriptions of a statue of Pompey himself from the temple that was attached to his theater, the Temple of Venus, which happens to be the, the temple where the Senate was meeting on the Ides of March, and by the way, today, appropriate date, the Ides of March, uh, the, at which the Senate was meeting on the Ides of March when <coughs> Caesar was assassinated. And that statue, although we don't have, a, we don't have it surviving, was Pompey uh, holding in his hand the globe. Uh, and these are not the only, the only examples, they're just two of the most powerful examples of, of people like Caesar and Pompey who claim to be the masters of Rome, not just claiming to be the masters of Rome and not just claiming to be the masters of the, the Orbis Terrarum, but claiming to be the masters of the entire globe. They, uh, they have power over the entire world. So somehow, despite the fact that Rome in, uh, in, in the second century, even more so, than in the, it will in the second century CE, even more so the, than, uh, well, the, sorry, in the second century BCE, even more so than the second century CE, Rome clearly had not conquered the entire world with their armies. They still somehow were able to, to claim power over it. 
So what I want to do now is take a look at some of the literature after Virgil, some of the literature of the Roman imperial period, so between the time of Augustus and the time of Trajan when the Roman Empire reaches its, its height, to see how the poetry of Rome copes with the question of total world empire. If Virgil could say, yes, there are, there are no limits to the Roman Empire, did that idea hold? And if it did hold, did the Romans think that having a total world empire was unquestionably a good thing? And the first text I want to look at, the first author I want to take a look at is, um, oh, actually, if I had notes, I would have realized that I was going to do one thing before I got to the Roman text, and that was frame the thing a little bit with, uh, with a bit of modern criticism. Um, uh, the, the thing that I've been working on recently is Virgil and Joyce. And that makes me think, when I think about the ancient world, also about comparisons with the modern world. And thinking about the Roman Empire makes me think a lot about the British Empire. In what ways, if Virgil is dealing with writing under the Roman Empire, how does James Joyce deal with the, the British Empire? Um, and so I think a lot about the, the, when I think about world conquest, I think not just about the, the Roman Empire, but also the sun never setting on the British Empire. And thinking about the way that the British Empire and its worldwide power affected literature, in 1988, Frederick Jameson said this. At this point, the phenomenological experience of the individual subject, traditionally the supreme raw materials of the work of art, and by art here, Jameson means literature as well as visual arts. So he's thinking about the, the individual person as the, the sort of person who produces a work of art. At this point, the, the phenomenological experience of the individual subject becomes limited to a tiny corner of the social world, a fixed camera view of a certain section of London or the countryside or whatever. But the truth of that experience no longer coincides with the place in which it takes place. The truth of that limited daily experience of London lies, rather in India or Jamaica or Hong Kong, it is bound up with the whole colonial system of the British Empire that determines the very quality of the individual's subjective life. And yet those structural coordinates are no longer accessible to immediate lived experience and are not, often not even conceptualizable for most people. What Jameson is talking about here is the idea that when you live in a globalized world, when the material conditions of your life are made up of stuff that is made in Hong Kong or stuff, you know, tea that is grown on a plantation in India, uh, when, when you no longer can conceive of the, the global system that produces the stuff that make your life what it is, there is a certain absence in your conception of who you are. The, that the, the daily experience of your life includes stuff that you really have no idea about, includes stuff that is absent from your mind. And he says when you're writing about who you are, and this is the, the supreme raw materials of the work of art, it's the experience of the individual subject, there are problems that come up when who you are is dependent on a system, the totality of which you can't grasp because it's global, it's beyond your experience. It is evident, he says, that this new situation poses tremendous and crippling problems for a work of art. And I have argued that it is an attempt to square this circle and to invent new and elaborate formal strategies for overcoming this dilemma that modernism, or perhaps better, the various modernisms as such emerge in forms that inscribe a new sense of the absent global colonial system on the very syntax of poetic language itself a new play of absence and presence that at its most simplified will be haunted by the erotic and tattooed with foreign place names, and at its most intense will involve the invention of remarkable new languages and forms. And if I have a, a, a strong thesis today, an, an overstated case, it's that the Romans, when they deal with the absent system of their large empire, when they deal with the idea of a global system, that they are attempting to relate to their own personal experience that becomes the materials or the raw materials of the work of art, that they, like the modernists, will invent weird new forms. If you've ever tried to read any James Joyce, Ulysses in particular, or say Finnegan's Wake, it's, it's weird, it's hard to read, the narrative is discontinuous, the language is odd, and we can see some of those things in Roman literature. Most of the passages that I want to look at are a lot more straightforward than James Joyce, but they will at the very least have these place names uh, and they'll betray some of the ways in which Roman poets are trying to reconcile their own experience with the, the global totality of the Roman Empire. 
And with that, the first author that I will actually want to look at is Seneca the Younger. Uh, and the first text that I would like to take a look at is Hercules Florens, that is, Raging Hercules or, or Mad Hercules. Sometimes it's just called Hercules. Um, and the author is Lucius Annaeus Seneca. We usually call him Seneca the Younger to distinguish him from Seneca the Elder, the, uh, the rhetorician and, uh, uh, and philosopher sort of. Seneca, is more, Seneca the Younger is more of a philosopher than Seneca the Elder was. And Seneca wrote the Hercules Florens in about, we guess, we have pretty reliable information for 53 CE, so right at the end of the reign of Claudius before Nero becomes uh, the, the Roman emperor. Um, and uh, the first passage I would like to look at is from the very beginning of the play when Hercules is described as being well known throughout the world. Where the sun bringing back the day and where the sun putting away the day colors both Ethiopian peoples with its neighboring torch. This is the idea that the sun at the eastern and western limits of the world is a bit closer and it makes people dark because it, uh, it burns them with its, its closeness. His fierce excellence is worshipped and he is described as a god through the whole world. Um, and we see here toto orbe in the Latin using the orbis as a short form of orbis terrarum. So Hercules is known through the whole world, and that seems to be a good thing. But as the play goes on, we find that things are not so great for Hercules being known through the whole world. In fact, while he's away on his labors, and particularly while he's in the <coughs> underworld, Amphitryon complains that what good do those things do? Hercules' great conquests, his labors, the fact that Hercules has defeated the monsters that make the world safe for people to live in. What good do those things do? He is absent from the world he defended. The earth has realized that the maker of its peace is away from his concerns. Prosperous and fortunate crime is called virtue. Good people obey wicked people. Justice is in weapons. And fear overwhelms laws. So here, says Seneca, is a problem. When you have a great hero like Hercules, who is the guy who is the maker of the world's peace. And peace in antiquity is actually kind of an interesting thing, because peace is something that is imposed. People in the, in the ancient world, it seems, they want to fight each other. I first uh, learned about this with a, a peace between the Greek city-states called the King's Peace, which is enforced by the king of the, the Persian Empire that he, uh, he prevents the Greek city-states from fighting each other. One of the, the things about being independent and not in the power of an empire is that you are able to declare war and fight other cities or other communities if you want to, but an empire imposes peace. Virgil talks about this in Book 6 of the Aeneid. He says it's the job of the Romans to impose peace on the world. Um, and here we see that Hercules is represented as the guy who imposes peace on the world. In other words, he, as the, uh, as the greatest hero, is the guy who, uh, who rules the world. But when that one ruler of the world, when there's one guy who imposes peace on the world, in other words, who, uh, who makes a world empire, when he's absent, then that means that injustice can come back. So here's a problem with having an empire like Rome does. If one guy rules the world, you are dependent on that guy when he's absent. And the Hercules Florence isn't done with problems. In fact, the, the last passage I want to look at from this play is from the end of the play, after Hercules has gone crazy and killed his wife and children, and then he's gotten sane again, and he's realized what he's done, and he wants to run away. But he is famous throughout the whole world, he's worshipped throughout the whole world, in fact he is represented in this play as though he is an emperor of the whole world, and that means that he's got nowhere to go. What place should I seek as a fugitive? Where should I hide myself? Or with what earth should I cover myself? What Tanais or what Nile, or what Tigris rushing with a Persian swell, or fierce Rhine or swollen Tagus, that one is in Spain, flowing with Iberian gold, could cleanse my right hand. Here's Jameson's tattooed with foreign place names showing up. Icy Myotis could pour its northern sea on me, and the whole of Tethys could flow over my hands. The crime will stick deep. Into what lands will you, guilty, retreat? Will you, speaking to himself, seek the rising or the setting, known everywhere, recalling that first passage, I have lost a place for exile. If for a place like ancient Athens or early Rome, you could exile someone just by kicking someone out of the, the, the city where you live, in the Roman Empire, exile increasingly becomes exile to someplace. You get sent to an island 
or you get confined to a city. And this is because you can't just kick someone out of the Roman Empire if the Roman Empire is conceived as a, a total world empire. If you are known everywhere, if Rome is everywhere, then you can't get outside Rome. And so one of the key punishments of classical antiquity, which is exiling criminals, becomes deeply problematic, at least in the conception of a, a total world empire. So here Seneca is saying that, yes, okay, Hercules, perhaps in uh, an analogous way to Rome, rules a total world empire. But Seneca isn't saying that this is an awesome thing. Jupiter is no longer comforting Venus by saying, yes, yes, your descendants, the Romans, will be great. Instead, Hercules' empire is a problem for the Romans themselves. They, uh, they have difficulty. Hercules' empire causes himself problems, first, by letting injustice enter the world when the maker of the world's peace is absent, and second, when something goes wrong with him, when he goes crazy, and Roman emperors did that, thank you know, Caligula, uh, eventually, prophetically, Nero was, you know, a bit wacky himself, when something goes wrong, then there is no place for them to go, there's no recourse for them, uh, and the world has a problem. Okay, so that's Seneca and the Hercules Forens. The next guy I want to take a look at is Seneca's nephew, Lucan, uh, or Marcus Annius Lucanus, who wrote an epic poem on the civil war between Caesar and Pompey. We usually call it the Bellum Civile, sometimes we call it the Pharsalia, after the, uh, the, 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 the culminating battle of this war, the decisive battle of the war at Pharsalus. Um, and Lucan wrote this poem between 60 and 65 CE. Uh, he seemed to have been great friends with Nero between about 60 and 62. Then they had a falling out. He was implicated in a failed assassination plot and was made to commit suicide in 65 CE with his poem probably unfinished, but there's some good arguments that maybe actually it was finished. And Lucan, like his uncle Seneca, is concerned with the total world empire of Rome. In fact, at the very beginning of the first book of his epic, he laments that the civil war between Caesar and Pompey prevented Rome from conquering the world, or at least prevented Rome from, at that time, conquering the entire world. He says, alas, how much of the earth and sea could have been fought with this blood which civil strife drained, the place whence the titan sun comes, where night puts away the stars, where midday burns in the fiery zone, and where midwinter, frozen and unable to be thawed by spring, binds the Black Sea with icy Scythian cold. So we have in astronomical terms here the far east and the far west, and the, uh, the, the fiery zone, the far south, and the place where spring never thaws, that is the far north up in the Black Sea. We have the, the four compass points defining the whole world. Already the Ceres, this is the name that the Romans used for the people they had met living in western China. The Ceres would have passed beneath the yoke. Already the barbarous Aras, this is a river in Armenia, and the race, if there is one that knows the source of the Nile, then Rome, if you have such love of unspeakable war, when you have put the whole world, uh, and we will know here the totem orbem, so the same words that Seneca used, when you have put the whole world under Latin laws, turn your hand against yourself, you have never yet lacked an enemy. So Lucan seems to deny that at least in the time of Caesar and Pompey, uh, that, the, that Rome had conquered the world. But here's an interesting thing. If Lucan was writing this, the first book of his epic, when he was still on good terms with Nero between 60 and 62 CE, Nero had actually launched three important expeditions, uh, or three important campaigns, one of which was a Praetorian detachment sent to find the source of the Nile. Another was uh, another command sent to find an overland northern route to the Far East, perhaps as a prelude to a military expedition against China. Uh, or at the very least uh, as a way of opening a route that would bypass the Parthians. Uh, and the third, and the, the largest, was his, he sent his general Corbulo on a campaign to fight over Armenia with the Parthians. So here we have the, the Ceres, that is the place that Nero is attempting to find a northern route to, to the Far East, the Aras, the river over which Corbulo is fighting, as Lucan is writing, and the source of the Nile, which Nero has sent some, some soldiers to try to find. So at least from the point of view of between 60 and 62, for Lucan, Nero is attempting to complete the total world conquest that Caesar and Pompey abandoned by fighting a civil war against each other. 
And in fact, he goes on to praise Nero, and he talks about how when Nero has died and become a god, uh, Nero will look over the whole world. And he says, but please do not choose for yourself a seat in the Arctic zone, nor where the hot pole of the opposite south curves <coughs> down from where you would see your own Rome with a slanted star. If you press down on one side of the measureless sky, the axis will feel the weight. Hold the weights of the heavenly scale in the middle of the sphere, and let that whole part of the tranquil sky be clear, and let no clouds block the view of Caesar, meaning Nero, the current Caesar. Then let the human race look after itself with arms put aside, and let every people love each other. Let peace, sent throughout the world, block the iron gates of warlike Janus. And there was a tradition in Rome uh, that the gates of the Temple of Janus should be open when Rome was at war and closed when Rome was not. So here, uh, at looking forward to the time when Nero has completed his reign and has died, Lucan seems to suggest that Nero will look over the entire world, having imposed peace, total world conquest, on that world. And moreover, not only does Lucan suggest that that will include the Arctic zone and where the south curves down, but he puts Rome <coughs> in the center. He says that the world will be balanced if Nero is over Rome at the center of the world. So he's imagining here a total world empire with Rome in the middle and the Roman god Nero right above it looking down and everything around it with the, the custom of Roman peace imposed on it. But things sort of fall apart for Lucan and Nero after that, and as he continues to write, he focuses more and more on the, the, the problematic issues of the, the Civil War and the fact that it, uh, how, how the Civil War dealt with world conquest. And in fact, he comes around to the idea that actually the Romans already had a total world empire in the time of Caesar and Pompey. Because in Book 3, he says, to ensure that lucky Caesar would receive all things at one stroke, Pharsalia presented him the world, and here we have the word at the end of the line again, the orbem, presented him the world to conquer all at once, suggesting that once you win control of Rome in the Civil War, what you win in when you win control of Rome is you win control of the whole world. And that's an issue because he's already said that at that time, Rome didn't have a total world empire. But he has a novel solution for this. One that I think is one of the things that Jameson is talking about when he says things about uh, remarkable new forms and new words. Because Lucan, after the, the, the big battle in Pharsalia, uh, after the, the battle in Book 7, Pompey has lost, um, and, uh, uh, and, the, and the, the, um, it turns out that, uh, that Pompey is going to invent uh, a new way of thinking about the world. So we can preface this by saying, in the voice of the narrator, what city, that is Rome, has ruled more widely, more quickly raced through favorable fates? Every war gave you nations. In every year, the Titan sun saw you advancing toward the two poles. So little space of the eastern land was remaining that the night was yours, the whole day was yours, the sky turned for you, and everything the wandering stars saw was Roman. So here he says, there was, okay, there was a little bit of the East that Rome hadn't conquered yet, but it was so close that it kind of counts. And then he takes a radical shift and has Pompey say, uh, as the Pompey is now the exile, so Pompey has lost the, the battle uh, to Caesar, he is the loser of the war, and he is now described as, uh, as an exile, as in the second line here, exile. But if you have a total world empire, where does the exile go? The exile here, Pompey has as companions the lords of the land and the ones holding eastern scepters. He orders Deotaras, who follows, uh, who follows the scattered tracks of his leader, to go into remote parts of the world. And he says, since the world, to the extent that it was Roman, that is, uh, Orbis qua Romanus era, to the extent that it was Roman, was lost in the Amathian, that is, the area around Pharsalus, was lost in the Amathian disaster. It remains most faithful of kings to try the loyalty of the East and the people who drink the Euphrates and the Tigris, still safe from Caesar. And one of the things that is really striking to me about this passage is that although we say the phrase, the Roman world, all the time, I, I, you know, we talk about the Greek and Roman worlds, or you know, the ancient Mediterranean world. We, we use the adjective Roman to modify the noun world all the time. Actually, in all of extant classical Latin literature, the only author to use the, the adjective Romanus to modify the noun orbis is Lucan. 
It's not until very late in, uh, in late antiquity that we start to see this happen again. So this is the very first time that Lucan does this, and in fact, the other times that we get the, that adjective modifying that noun are also in this poem. And here we have the, the Roman world, which means that Pompey can suggest that Rome did have a total world empire, but it didn't include the lands in the east, like the people who, uh, who drank from the Tigris and the Euphrates, because after all, that was an entirely different world. It was a different Orbis. And he describes that different world, saying, therefore, get up, companions, let us go into the eastern world. Uh, the Proparemus in, uh, in Orbem, he says, Eom in Orbem, uh, let us go into the eastern world. The Euphrates separates a huge world with its current, the Caspian gates close off measureless retreats, a different pole turns Assyrian nights and days, the sea with different colored water is cut off from ours, and it has its own ocean. So Lucan, in the voice of Pompey, is here proposing that in fact the East is a different world astronomically defined. It's got different poles than the, the Western world of Europe. It's got a different ocean than the Western world of Europe. Uh, in other words, he can salvage a total world empire for Rome by saying that the world was Roman, by inventing the Roman world, which means only the Western part of the world and not the Eastern part of the world. For those of you who know the story, Pompey ends up deciding not to go to that far east. Instead, he goes to Alexandria, where he gets killed, and everybody is very sad, or at least Lucan is very sad, and Caesar is very sad, too, because he didn't want Pompey to be killed. Um, but anyway, Pompey dies, and, uh, and no one else seems to talk about the Roman world after that. But here is Lucan inventing a, a new way of speaking and a new way of thinking about the world to try to reconcile the Roman total world empire with the knowledge that, in fact, all three of those expeditions that I talked about that Nero had launched, Corbulo fighting uh, uh, with the Parthians for Armenia, the expedition to find the Nile, uh, or the source of the Nile, and the expedition to find a northern route to the Far East, all three of those expeditions by 65, or rather by 63, when Lucan was writing the later parts of the poem, had failed. In other words, Nero was not going to achieve the total world empire that seemed possible between 60 and 62 when Lucan was writing the first parts of that poem. Okay, so so far we've seen two authors, one from the time of Claudius and one from the time of Nero, writing about the, the total world empire. And we've seen some of what Jameson talks about, some of the, the studying of literature with foreign place names, some remarkable new aspects of language, uh, but what's striking to me about these, these passages is their difference from someone like Virgil, who seems so optimistic about the results of the, the empire. And I'll talk a little bit about that again at the, at the end of the talk in, in my conclusion. Um, but the, the, the fact that Lucan and Seneca seem so pessimistic, what's, there's an issue for them when they talk about the Roman Empire and conquering the entire world. It doesn't seem like such a good thing. In fact, especially for Seneca, he's raising the problems of world conquest rather than the benefits. And I want to take a look now uh, at two more authors, uh, one from the Flavian period and one from the, the subsequent period, the Nervan Antonine period, who talk about the Roman Empire, not so much total world conquest, but talk about some of the, the issues involved in having an empire as large as the Romans. So the first one I want to look at is Statius, and I want to look at a poem from Statius' Silvi, some occasional court poetry that he wrote between 92 and 96 CE. This is, uh, is not Statius, um, uh, as the last one was not Lucan, the last one uh, picture was Nero, because we don't have a good picture of Lucan, and this guy is Domitian, because we don't have a, a good picture of Statius. So this is the emperor under which Statius was, uh, was writing the poem that I want to talk about. His name is Publius Papinius Statius, and we'll be taking a look at a passage from one of the Silvi. In fact, Silvi 3, 3, lines 85 to 98. And this is a poem uh, that is dedicated to a guy named Claudius Etruscus. And Claudius' father has just died, and his father was a freedman from the Asian city of Smyrna. That is, he was brought to Rome as a slave and free, uh, and he was an imperial freedman. He was in charge of the, the imperial treasury. And one of the things that Statius says in praise of the father of Claudius Etruscus goes like this. 
And now a lofty light has shone on the pious house, and the towering, and towering fortune has entered at full stride. Now is entrusted to one man the distribution of the sacred resources and the riches produced by all the peoples and the expenses of the great, or the expenses of the great world. Whatever Iberia sends forth from the gold mines, what shines on the Dalmatian mountain, what is swept up from African harvests, whatever the floor of the boiling Nile threshes, what the, un what the underwater searcher of the eastern sea collects, and the cultivated herds of Lacedaemonian Galaisus, and the transparent snow and Massilian oak, and the treasure of the Indian tusk, the things that Boreas, that's the north wind, brings in, and here's Eurus and cloudy Auster are entrusted to one minister, you would sooner count the winter rain and the leaves of the forest. So here we have the idea that the Roman Empire brings in to Rome, into the center of the world, uh, the, the whatever it is that the world produces, right? He says the, the, uh, the riches produced by all the people <coughs> and the expenses of the great world. So everything that the world produces comes to Rome. Uh, this is uh, the centralization of the, the resources, the exploitation of the periphery by the center in Rome. But what's particularly interesting to me about this image of the centralization of all the resources of the world in Rome is that here these resources enrich the father of Claudius Etruscus, who is a freedman from the east. In other words, the court of Domitian is filled with new immigrants. And this is an issue even from the time of Augustus. In fact, in the time of Augustus, there were a couple of laws about uh, freeing slaves, manumitting slaves. One was the, the, um, the Lex Pupia Caninia of 2 BCE, and another was the Lex Aelia Sentia of 4 CE. And both of these laws put limits on the, the number of slaves that could be freed in certain circumstances, the age of slaves that could be freed, and some of the citizen rights of certain slaves that were freed. And these are often interpreted as sumptuary laws. That is, freeing slaves in large numbers was an extravagant gesture. Um, and so the, you can't be so generous and display your riches because it makes people envious. But what I really think they are, and there are uh, a lot of other people who agree with me on this, is that they're anti-immigration laws. Mortality in pre-modern cities was massive. And for a city like Rome with a population of a million, it, there was no way that the birth rate could catch up with the death rate. Malaria was rampant, there were you know, dead people everywhere, and you needed people coming into Rome to maintain the population. And the way that the Romans often did this was by importing slaves from around the empire. And when a slave was free, that slave became a Roman citizen. So limiting the, the, the rights of citizens to free slaves was, in effect, an anti-immigration measure. And we see here Statius talking about an immigrant to Rome, a slave from the East who was brought to Rome and freed and made a Roman citizen and made enormously wealthy as the image of the centralization of resources. In other words, it's not just all the resources of the world that are brought together, but the people of the world as well. And if Statius values that positively, writing a, a consolation poem to, the, the son, to Claudius Etruscus, the son, about his father's death, not everyone did. The last poet that I want to take a look at is Juvenal, who is writing in the, in the next dynasty, a generation later, and he is a satirist. In fact, he's, uh, he's famous for writing a poem which includes the line, who watches the watchman, right? You, uh, that is, you can, if you don't trust your wife not to cheat on you, you can set a guard, a watchman, who will, uh, who will keep an eye on her, but who watches the watchman? She's just gonna cheat on you with the guard. So the, this is, uh, this is uh, a, a line from Juvenal that has made it into some modern popular culture. His name is Decimus Unius Juvenalis, uh, and he wrote from uh, 100 to 127 CE. So we're thinking now about the very height of the, the, the Roman Empire. Um, that map that I showed you of, Roman, of the Roman Empire, its greatest territorial extent was from about 117 CE. And Juvenal begins his satires uh, in the first satire by saying, when that member of the Nile's mob, when that native slave of Canobus Crispinus weighs summer gold on sweaty fingers, his shoulder hitching up a Tyrian cloak, he, and he is unable to bear the weight of the great gem, it is difficult not to write satire. He says he writes satire, he, uh, he criticizes Rome, uh, he writes this satire because there are slaves 
from places like Hanopos in Egypt being brought to Rome. They wear Tyrian, that is Eastern clothes, and they become enormously wealthy. In other words, one of Juvenal's primary reasons for being angry about Rome is immigration. And maybe the clearest anti-immigration passage in Juvenal is from Satire 3, when he says, the race that is now most welcome to our rich people and whom I will flee headlong, I will hasten to say, he's going to identify the people that he hates most, nor will shame stand in the way. I, Romans, am not able to bear a Greek city. And here I've capitalized city because I think he means the city in the way that people in New York City talk about the city. He means Rome here. He's unable to bear Rome becoming Greek. And of course, Rome has inherited all kinds of Greek culture and has imported all kinds of Greek slaves who have, many of them have, been, uh, have, have, uh, have become Roman citizens. But what portion of the dregs is Achaean, that is Greek? He says, actually, you know, there are more people than, uh, than Greeks coming to Rome. Already, for a long time, the Syrian Orontes, the uh, river in Syria, has, uh, has flowed into the Tiber, and it has brought with it its language and customs and its slanting cores along with the flute and its familiar drum and the girls ordered to sell themselves at the circus. So here, Juvenal's complaint is that the people from all over the empire, and in particular from the east, from Syria, are coming to Rome and they are, they are making Rome un-Roman. So just like Statius, he's talking about the, the empire as a big place and the, the resources of the world and the people of the world coming into Rome. And this is an image that we see in imperial poetry all the time. But we seldom see people quite as angry as Juvenal about the way that these people are supposedly making Rome un-Roman, the, the idea here that, uh, that he, he just can't stand the city that Rome is becoming, and in fact he will flee Rome uh, because Rome is, uh, is, not very, uh, is not very Roman at all. So like the earlier poets, Statius and Juvenal uh, talk about not just the, the, the advantages that having a world empire gives you, but the disadvantages, the problems. They have complaints about the Roman world empire. So I said a little earlier that at the end I was going to come back and talk about Virgil. And there's a, there's a long-standing debate in Virgil studies about whether the Aeneid is really positive about the Roman Empire. That is, how optimistic is it? When, uh, when Jupiter says to Venus that he has given the Romans imperium sine fine, uh, is that really a good thing? But usually that debate focuses on the costs of empire for the victims of conquest, for the victims of empire. That is, Virgil presents the guys that Rome fights against in a very sympathetic fashion, and we feel sorry for them that they have lost. In other words, when people say that uh, they have a pessimistic reading of Virgil, what they usually mean is that Virgil is not such a big fan of Augustus because he thinks Augustus perhaps is behaving in unjust ways in subjecting the world to the rule of the Roman people. Um, this is a matter of some debate still, uh, whether or not Virgil is fully supportive of the Roman Empire or not. But if he's not, he's not because he thinks that the Roman Empire is hurting other people. But subsequent to that, in Virgil's successors, in people like Seneca and Lucan, uh, and especially someone like Juvenal, the problems that Rome has with empire, the, the pessimism about empire, is not so much altruistic, if we, can, if we can call Virgil's pessimism that. It's not so much about the damage that the Roman Empire does to the world. It's about the damage that having a world empire does to Rome itself. Uh, that Hercules had the problem that he had no place to, to go into exile. Uh, and Lucan was saying that uh, when Rome has conquered the world, it turns its, its weapons on itself. And in fact, he's forced in the end to salvage a concept of the world empire by sundering the world, by breaking the world in two and separating the east with, with two different poles. And even though Statius, writing very, uh, very optimistically in the, in the time of Domitian, even though Statius can say that in fact it's great that the, that the Roman empire is enriching Romans, Juvenal can complain that the sort of Romans that the Roman Empire is enriching are immigrant Romans, are, are people like Claudius Etruscus' father, uh, people who are coming from the East uh, and are, uh, are becoming wealthy with the resources that are, are flowing into Rome. So with, if, I, if I started with the, uh, the question of what is this, this cognitive dissonance between the idea of a total world empire and, a, uh, and a, a partial world empire? Did the Romans really believe that they conquered the entire world? 
They seem to, by the time of the, the height of the Roman Empire in, uh, in the second century CE, they seem to have, have moved away from that question. In fact, it's almost assumed in Statius that the Roman Empire is worldwide. But the new question, the question that occupies them is, is that any good? If Rome does have a total world empire, does Rome want a total world empire? And if we could be sort of optimistic about Virgil and say, hey, you know, Virgil at least is standing up for the little guy, it's harder to be sympathetic with guys like Juvenal uh, and guys like Seneca who are less concerned with the costs of empire for its victims and more concerned with the costs of empire for the conquerors themselves. Um, and I'll just close with an anecdote from uh, an old colleague of mine who used to say that it's, it, in his Roman history lectures that it's not necessary to like the Romans to do well in this class, but if you do like the Romans, well, the university has excellent counseling services, suggesting that, in fact, we, we study ancient Rome, but those of us who study it for long enough find plenty to dislike about the Romans uh, and plenty that's not very sympathetic. And this is one of the things that, uh, while I think the poetry is great, I also think that, uh, that, that when I read ancient Roman poetry, I try to distance myself a little bit from the attitude of the Romans. And when I think about things like imperialism in the modern world and globalization, I try to think as much as possible not like Romans rather than actually like Romans. That's what I have to say. Thanks for listening. I think we have a, a few minutes for questions here. We also have a nice reception provided by Hendricks Murphy uh, outside around the corner afterwards. So, if there's any questions, are you willing to take some? I am willing to take questions right, if there are any out there. Yeah, and there's a couple in the back already. Uh, so, the problems in Hercules. Oh, yeah. That, uh, he can't be exiled anywhere. Yeah. He has nowhere to be exiled, and that when he isn't there, there is no peace. Right. How it can he not be there if there is no place to be exiled? I just don't right. Know okay. So yeah, the, the 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 at the time of the the opening of the play. I'm sorry, this wasn't clearer. But at the time of the opening of the play, Hercules is is engaged in the labor that takes him to the underworld. Right. So he's got to go do his thing with Cerberus, um, which means that he is absent from the world because he's actually in the land of the dead. Um, so it, the fact that he is absent from the empire doesn't, and this is convenient for Seneca. Uh, it doesn't mean that he can't be he can't be anywhere in the world because he's actually not anywhere in the world. Um, he's uh, he's in the the underworld in the land of the dead, and it's not until he comes back from the underworld that he's he's present in the world again. So uh, so it's a it's a convenient loophole for for Seneca. One of the things that I think is perhaps going on in the in the question of the the ruler of the world wanting to be away from the world or the ruler of the world needing to be away from the world um, may be the the issue of Tiberius, right? The, uh, Augustus' successor, Tiberius, who was in his 50s by the time Augustus died and he, he became Roman emperor, he had tried to retire uh, long before that. And in fact, Augustus had a problem with the people that he would designate to be his successors trying to retire. Um, his grandson and adopted son, Gaius, when he tried to do this, uh, well, it turned out that he was actually mortally wounded and was dying from a stab wound at the time when he tried to retire. So, well, you know, he, he at least had an excuse. But Tiberius, he, he couldn't get away. Like, wherever he tried to go, uh, the, the duty of empire called to him. And Augustus felt sort of betrayed by this, but Tiberius, uh, he, he, he couldn't find a way to get away. And eventually, he did have to become the Roman emperor, and he, he did his job. Some people say well, and some people say very poorly. Um, but that question of where can the emperor go <coughs> to get away from the empire was one that actually had occupied the mind of, of Rome's second emperor, Tiberius. And so when it shows up in Hercules, I think we, we can see some historical precedent. Of course, Tiberius couldn't go to the underworld to escape the duty because he couldn't go to the underworld and come back. Um, but uh, I think that, yeah, it's convenient for Seneca that Hercules does go to the underworld. Yeah. This might be a chicken and egg question. Okay. But, um, so the idea of geocentricity yeah. for uh, Romans, when they thought that uh, the Roman, like Rome proper, was more or less the center of the earth, did they think that the fact that their city was by the center of the earth, and the, the right, yeah, the, the center of the, the Orbis Terrarum, yeah, 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 
Yeah. Where it's convenient, it's not too cold, it's not too hot, it's yeah. not too wet. So, so did, they, did they think that the fact that they were here gave them an advantage with taking over the world and that they could spread out farther? Or was it after they took over the world that they sort of, in narcissistic retrospect, decided that they were the middle? Yeah, I think, I think it's a bit of both. Okay. Um, and one place to look at this is in, um, in Vitruvius, who's a, a, an architectural writer who talks about the, the people who live in the far north and the people who live in the far south, and the advantages uh, of living in Rome, which is not too hot and not too cold, <coughs> which makes a you know, better kind of person and a hardier kind of, of warrior, um, and it, it gives Rome a natural advantage in civilization. Um, Baro also seems to, to have this kind of attitude, that Rome is in the center, and that's why Rome is the best, because it produces the best people because it's in the center. But there are also subtle ways in which that center seems to move around. So in Ovid's Metamorphoses, there's a geographical movement from the east to the west, that is from Greece <coughs> to Rome, as universal history proceeds. So there's an acknowledgment that that center moves. And there's an interesting passage in Lucan too, um, Lucan inventing all kinds of interesting ways to talk about world geography and the center and the periphery. There's an interesting passage in Lucan where uh, someone named Bossar is going to the Oracle of Ammon, um, and he says that the, the thing about that, that oracle is that you can, you can stand in the, the, the center and look to the horizon and not, not see anything. And the way he expresses it is, is actually describing that a person is standing in the center of the world in a way that moves the center with the person. In other words, Lucan, always the linguistic innovator and the guy whose syntax is so tortured in a way that I think Jameson would, would recognize as modernist or at least mannerist, um, is inventing a, a, a system in which the center of the world moves with the, the person who is perceiving that center of the world. In other words, he, he sort of uh, makes unpermanent where the center is. And if you take a look, as I, I, I don't have a, a convenient slide of it, but if you, if you were to find that passage, I think you would see that there's, a, there's an interesting sort of de-anchoring of the, the center in Roman thought, at least in some ways. So some Romans seem to think that the, the, the center came first and it gave Romans advantages. And other Romans seem to think that that center was movable and the center became Rome when Rome became the, the world ruling power. In other words, that the, the, the other thing, the, if, the, if the first one was the egg argument, there are other Romans who seem to buy the chicken argument. Get the monument in the old city too, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, so I had kind of a comment slash question, um, especially when it comes to uh, what you said about the threat slash pressure of the person sitting on the throne of the world. Oh, yeah. Really, it's sort of like the old tale of like the sword of Damocles. Yeah. Um, and to so, do you think? The, the literature and your perspective that you've read about like the pressures of uh, being in control of the world as the Romans knew it were more so about like the perils that it brought or the fact that like the character of the person who sat in that seat had to be m more grandiose than your normal average person. Yeah, I mean I think there was great optimism at the beginning of the Neronian prince, but when, when Nero uh, became emperor that he, he had good teachers, and he, he seemed like a good guy. And it was always the case that Roman emperors kept saying, okay, the last guy, he turned out to be so bad, but I am gonna bring back the, the, the rule of Augustus. In other words, there was a lot of importance <coughs> attached to the, the, the character of the emperor and, uh, and who he was. But at the same time, you're right that it's, uh, it's a position of enormous pressure, something that I think Tiberius recognized, recognized more than most. Um, and the, the idea that, um, that the, the, the position um, brought, with it, brought with it great danger. Maybe <coughs> even uh, a way to think about this is that you know, the, uh, the people who, the, the reason the, the Julio-Claudian dynasty didn't continue is that basically anyone who could become emperor started getting killed because you either, uh, you, you couldn't tolerate a, a potential rival. As, uh, as emperor. So the idea was you, uh, if you were in the imperial family, you had to try to become emperor, or you had to be, you had to be killed off. Um, you, would, you would die. Um, so the, the question there is that, you know, just being in the high circles of politics, being uh, someone who could possibly become emperor, 
is extremely dangerous whether you're emperor or whether you're not even, even emperor yet. There's always a, a, a sword hanging over you. And when it goes badly, there's, there's, no, there's no middle ground for it going badly. It's going to go catastrophically badly all, in every way. Um, and that's just, a, I think, a, a consequence that the Romans were, were realizing with horror was what happens when you have one man in charge of the, the whole world, that if it goes bad, it, it goes monumentally bad. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> I, I was just wondering, is, is, do you find Romans to be very particular and unique in the aspect of uh, the way they view their empire and the world, the world that they, they had? Or is something like the Parthian Empire, who was also you know, at the same time period, how did they view themselves? Or is there very similar, are there similar trends or threads within the empires generally, or are they really one of the one of the really interesting things about the, the ancient world is people sort of uh, people sort of assume, uh, and you, you see this in something like um, like Tom Habeneck's book on um, on the origins of Latin literature. People assume that Latin literature was sort of inevitable. That of course, if you're going to run an empire, one of the great tools of running an empire is having a literature for, for various reasons. It, it produces a literary dialect that is aristocratic. So if somebody gives you an order in the aristocratic dialect, you carries authority, and you know that you're supposed to follow. Right? When people give you orders in certain language, you're more likely to follow them than if they give you orders <coughs> in uh, another kind of language. But it's actually not really true that in the ancient world, having a, a literature was, uh, uh, was essential for running an empire. Um, and in fact, the Parthians had uh, only a really sort of limited literature, and the, the aristocratic Parthian class was completely illiterate. Uh, they, they didn't read or write at all. They had scribes to, to take care of that for them. And the Carthaginians, too, it seemed like they had a, a, a certain amount of literature, but nothing like the institution of, of Greek literature or, or Roman literature. And one of the reasons why the Greece and Rome are so important to us is not just because of the greatness of their empire. Certainly, the Roman Empire wasn't the only empire in antiquity, um, and not just because of, uh, of things like Greek democracy, but because these are the cultures that produced the texts that would survive for us to talk about. So yeah, we do have some records of, of Parthian history, and we know a lot about the Parthian Empire, just like we know a lot about Carthage and the Carthaginian Empire. But we don't have the, the sort of poetry, the sort of literature that gives us access into the, the, the thought process of elite Parthians or Carthaginians in the way that we do elite Romans. And so it's really hard to make comparisons between the way that Romans thought about their empire as a world empire and the way that, say, Parthians or Carthaginians thought about their empire as a world, world empire. It's maybe a little bit easier for us with Alexander the Great. But even there, uh, the, you know, by the, by the, the Hellenistic period, um, it's harder to see the, and, and because the empire fragmented so early, it's harder for us to isolate over, over time the changing attitudes and the, the different positions that one could hold on, the, on the, the idea of Alexander's world empire, at least until the coming of Rome. So in that sense, I don't think that, that there is really a, a, a good way to compare the attitudes of inhabitants of and participants in ancient empires. And so even though the Roman Empire isn't unique, the sort of records that we have, the sort of ways that we can look into the, the mind of the Romans uh, is unique uh, in a way that prevents good comparison. So I'm going to get maybe a one, one more question, and then uh, Dr. Bogazelski will be very happy to uh, entertain a variety of questions out of the reception. Oh, you, yeah, uh, for sure. Take advantage of that. So, um, yeah, you've been waiting a while. <coughs> Have you seen any commonalities between the foreign policy of ancient Rome and um, modern America as far as their justification for spreading their empire? For example, like the United States often uses the banner of democracy, bringing democracy yeah. to these lands in order to seize foreign assets. Yeah, um, and you know, it, it is really tempting. One of the reasons why I chose this juvenile passage is just because of current issues and attitudes about Syrian immigration in the States. It's really tempting to make comparisons between ancient Rome and the, the, the modern US. Uh, if you guys have heard the term Pax Romana, there are people who talk about Pax Americana. Um, the sense that even though 
the, the Romans recognized independent peoples outside of their empire, they still imagined themselves as the world's only superpower, and this is what allowed them to imagine themselves as in charge of the globe. And it's hard not to see the, the sort of the, the, the American exceptionalism and the, the last remaining superpower idea as something that is very much like the, the Roman Empire, the idea that uh, that the, the U.S. should lead peacekeeping forces that will impose the custom for peace on the world, which after all is, uh, you know, should be a, a benefit. But it carries risks uh, and problems not only for the, the victims of those efforts, the, not only for the people outside the, the U.S., but also there are going to be plenty of people inside the, the U.S. Who are, who are not happy about it. I think it's true that, the, the, that those comparisons are, uh, are easy to make, but they're also uh, a bit dangerous. You know, a history uh, in some ways repeats itself, but it never repeats itself in exactly the same way. Um, and I think that for me, what I try to do is less use ancient Rome to think about the US now and what's happening with the US, and more to use the things that I know from the modern world, thinking about, say, Jameson and the British Empire, as well as the, the so-called Pax Americana, um, the, the American piece, you know, think, uh, thinking about the, the <coughs> Roman world as a way to look at the, the Roman world with fresh eyes. You know, Stan and I were talking earlier today about how hard it is to say original things about topics that are 2,000 years old. Um, but one of the ways that we can, we can look at these old topics with fresh eyes is by, by seeing things from the present, seeing things with, with information. In some ways, the distance that we have from the Romans and the, the comparison that we have with the, the modern world allows us to see things about the Romans that the Romans themselves couldn't see. And for me, the, the, the real benefit, and I realize this is you know, not going to be the way for all people, but for me, the real benefit of those comparisons is not so much learning about the, the US as using the example of the US to understand ancient Rome in a, in a better way. All right, let's thank Dr. Ferman. Let's go.